once again. Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. Morning, everyone. Uh, so for my presentation today, I thought I would have a look at the concept of nudging and how it's been used in antimicrobial stewardship um, in some studies that various people have done and, and how that has had an impact on stewardship. So the reason why I chose this topic is I um, read this uh, excellent editorial um, from the BMJ Quality and Safety Journal, uh, which was published earlier this year, um, but was actually available online last year. And it talked about how uh, nudges can be used in the design of electronic systems to either improve patient care or, um, or to sort of drive um, medical management in the opposite direction. And because of um, a lot of what I do in my day-to-day -day job is involved in um, designing electronic systems and things, um, I thought this was a, a worthwhile area to explore a little bit further. So what I'll briefly talk about is what is a nudge, and I suppose it's uh, it, it in the context of behavioural economics. Um, look at some real world examples out there that you uh, might come across um, on a day-to-day -day basis but might not realise, and, um, and also have a look at some papers relating to its use in antimicrobial stewardship. So I just wanted to have a look at three papers in a, in a little bit of detail, uh, but obviously there have been lots of papers uh, published in this area. So what is a nudge? The, the concept itself has been around since the 90s, but it was brought to prominence by um, a Chicago uh, professor by the name of Richard Thaler, who um, together with uh, Dr. Sunstein in, 20, uh, in 2008 wrote a book called Nudge. And um, Richard Thaler actually won last year's Nobel Prize in economics for this particular topic. So I think that's become even more prominent since, since that occurred. And his definition of a nudge is something that alters people's behaviour in a predictable way without forbidding any options or significantly changing their economic incentives. And in order for something to count as a nudge, the intervention must be easy, uh, but also cheap to avoid. Uh, I suppose taking a step backwards a little bit and, and talking a little bit about behavioural economics. So, um, so I suppose traditional economics uh, assumes that somebody will always make um, a choice based on their economic best interests, whereas behavioural economics recognises that there's lots and lots of factors that have an impact on this. So there are psychological, emotional, cultural, social factors, etc., that um, mean that actually not every decision that somebody makes is done in a completely rational and fully informed manner. And so there's a couple of terms that people talk about. So one is this concept of heuristics, which is the fact that as humans, we make mental shortcuts all the time for the vast majority of our decisions. It's not possible for us to make every single decision in a fully considered um, manner. Uh, and also the concept of framing where your perception of something changes on depending on what you use as a base. So, for example, a doctor's perception of the risk of gentamicin toxicity might depend on if he's been using it for 40 years and never had a problem versus if he's used it a little bit and had people with um, adverse outcomes. Um, and, and so all of that, it, it's basically saying that humans don't always make uh, decisions based on their own best interests. There's lots of factors that influence us. And so, it's into this context that a nudge comes in. And so it's, it's, it's sort of an indirect suggestion that's made by altering the environment to influence our behaviour and decision making. The, one of the key things about a nudge is that the intervention should be relatively easy to implement. Uh, and also it's something called, it, it should be cheap to avoid. And what, what we mean by that is um, it, it doesn't forbid any options or significantly change someone's economic or emotional incentives um, to, to be influenced by it. And so that's in contrast to very direct interventions like education or um, taking a step further enforcement and legislation. So these are some uh, nudges that have been used um, in, uh, in the world. So, so the one, the, the yellow bin is called a ballot bin and uh, it's used to try and reduce uh, cigarette litter 
um, and it's been implemented in some um, areas in the UK and the US. And so rather than having big signs saying, do not litter, you know, throw your cigarettes in the rubbish bin, what they've done is they've designed a bin that asks you to vote with your cigarette butts. And so indirectly, that helps to combat cigarette litter. Uh, a, a lot of you may um, be aware that your recycling bin from your council um, might be larger than your normal bin and so that's an effort to try and encourage you to recycle, although that probably doesn't work so much now with the recycling crisis. Uh, the picture down the bottom is a um, picture of a urinal in um, I think this one is implemented in uh, the airport in Amsterdam and, and they've painted a picture of a little house fly on the urinal to encourage people to aim uh, rather than and in an effort to sort of reduce mess in the men's bathroom. Uh, and also the My Health record. Uh, so where a nudge is applicable in that setting is that it started off as an opt-in system and that failed pretty miserably and so they've now moved to an opt-out system. So that's a nudge to try and encourage a certain type of behaviour. So how is this relevant to AMIS? Um, so I suppose when you think about it, a lot of what we do that's sort of quite fundamental in AMS um, is very important, but it's also quite labour intensive. So things like post-prescription review, audit and feedback, having a restriction policy require <coughs> constant monitoring and reinforcement. And, and so the thought is, well, can we use some sort of a nudge to, to influence this to either make it so that it's not as labour intensive or to further enhance its effect. Uh, and I, I thought, well, I suppose one of the, the big things that's um, happening at the moment is, is the, um, the integral nature in which electronic systems are now used in uh, patient management and medical care. And so uh, I suppose a significant amount of clinician time is now spent interacting with an electronic system compared with direct patient contact. And so the, the design of those systems can influence clinician behaviour. And I suppose it's a, good, it's a good opportunity to see whether we can build nudges into the design of systems to help um, improve AMS. So there are lots and lots of papers examining the impact of nudges on patient care, and I just wanted to have a look at three. The first two are specifically around the design of electronic systems, and then the third is a, a peer feedback um, study. So the very first one I wanted to talk about was uh, a, an American study, and they looked at the design of their computerised physician order entry um, in terms of trying to minimise the ordering of unnecessary urine tests. And so what they did is that um, prior to the intervention, they had, um, so all, all four of these options were available in a, like in a favourites menu, so like an easily accessed um, frequently order tests menu. Uh, and what they did is after the intervention, they removed all of, all of them except for one, so that the only thing that they had left was um, something called urinalysis with reflex to microscopy, which basically means uh, the lab does a dipstick and then if the dipstick is positive, then they do a microscopy. They removed um, a test where the lab does a dipstick and if that's positive, then they move to a culture and they also removed uh, urine macroscopic and urine microscopic. So these were still available, but they were buried underneath a different menu option, which required an additional two mouse clicks. And the doctor could also order a, a standard urine cult, but that was in another menu which required an additional three mouse clicks. So they were still there, but they were um, much, more, uh, much less visible and, and I suppose more difficult to, to access. And essentially they found, uh, compared from pre-intervention to post-intervention, that there was quite a substantial reduction in the amount of tests that were being uh, ordered. So um, in the... Um, so this was, uh, yeah, so they had a, a reduction in urinalysis, in urine microscopy, in cultures performed and catheterised cultures as well. And uh, when they did a, a, um, a statistical adjustment to adjust for temporal trends, they found a 46.6% reduction in the daily culture rate per 1,000 ED visits, which is quite a marked uh, change. They also wanted to look at whether there was any unintended harm. So they wanted to see for those patients who were subsequently admitted to the ward, if the, if the admitting doctor said, oh my goodness, why didn't they do this in the ED? And then were they more likely to order cultures after the intervention compared with before? Um, and they didn't 
The study was underpowered to detect this. They didn't detect a statistically significant difference. Um, but I suppose there, there was a little bit of a difference. Um, not, not huge, um, but for the most part, the, the authors concluded that it didn't make a huge amount of difference um, for patients who were subsequently um, admitted to the ward. So the authors concluded that um, removing options from a frequently accessed menu and burying them elsewhere reduced the frequency of ordering of urine tests and a relatively simple change uh, in the electronic system can greatly alter clinician ordering practices. Uh, and so I suppose what I took away from this is that um, we all know that clinicians are very time poor. And I think when I've been involved in developing systems, there seems to always be this tension between making something quick and easy to access and easy to perform uh, versus slowing that process down and actually guiding them through to the most appropriate choice. Uh, and uh, I suppose it says that, you know, making something easily accessible and easy to do may not always be the best thing to do. So the second paper uh, was actually published several years before the first one, but um, it acted as a little bit of a contrast. So, so with that previous paper, they, they clearly wanted to bury those options um, elsewhere in the EMR. Whereas with this paper, um, it discussed the importance of menu design, even if it was very, very subtle and you actually didn't restrict or bury anything, everything was still there. And it looked at the impact of grouping or partitioning certain options in a certain way. Um, so this was done as a, a, a case study based survey of primary care providers in the US and they were given seven vignettes. Um, so three vignettes were the outcome was that they shouldn't have needed antibiotics um, and four cases uh, where they did need antibiotics. Um, and so the participants were randomly assigned to different visual representations of the order menus, um, uh, although the answer options themselves remain the same. So this is an example of the acute bronchitis case uh, where antibiotics are not required. So half of the group got, um, uh, they got, they were randomised to this menu option where the prescription items were listed separately and the over-the-counter ones were grouped together. And the other proportion were, it, it was in the opposite direction. So the non-prescription items were listed separately and the prescription items were grouped together. Uh, this is a, an example of one of the cases that did require antibiotics. So this is a cellulitis example and a similar sort of thing. One menu option was where the broader spectrum antibiotics were listed similarly and the narrow spectrum antibiotics were grouped together. Uh, and the other option was when the narrow spectrum antibiotics were listed individually and all the broad spectrum options were grouped together. So they analysed as to whether the clinicians chose the more aggressive treatment option. And so for the cases that didn't need antibiotics, they said aggressive treatment was where they chose at least one prescription drug. And for cases that did require antibiotics, they classified aggressive treatment as um, where they chose broader spectrum over narrow spectrum. And so they had around about a 50% uh, survey response rate. Um, and there weren't any um, significant differences in the demographics between the two, um, the, the, the responders versus the non-responders. So their findings um, were very interesting. Uh, overall, there was an 11.5% reduction in the choice of aggressive treatments, where those aggressive treatments were grouped together at the bottom compared with when they were listed separately. And the trend was pretty much seen across um, all the different vignettes with the exception of sinusitis, although that wasn't a statistically significant change. Uh, but they said, generally speaking, the, the differences were more marked in the cases where um, treatment was required versus the cases where actually you didn't need any treatment at all. And so the authors um, concluded that individually listing appropriate choices uh, increased their prominence, which makes sense, uh, but also perhaps implied um, to the reader that they were the most common and appropriate choices. And so that sort of steers them more towards choosing those compared with the ones that are grouped together down the bottom. And so my thought on this paper was that it was um, such a simple and such a subtle intervention uh, 
nothing changed. I mean, everything was still there. Nothing was buried or made more difficult. Um, it was it was very subtle, and, the, and I'm sure that the end users wouldn't have even realised what was happening. Um, and so my thought was that, well, even very small subtle changes in, in design can actually have a big impact on clinician behaviour without actually restricting doctors' prescribing choices. Um, and obviously the converse is true, is that subtle changes can have a big detrimental effect um, depending on how they're designed. So uh, there's other papers looking um, at the design of electronic systems and so uh, broadly speaking these are just some of the things that they found is that having a tick box on an, a standard order set entices you to tick it irrespective of whether or not it's actually needed. Um, in terms of trying to minimise recurring pathology orders, so requiring um, even sort of common frequent tests to be ordered on a daily basis rather than remaining on a recurring list reduces unnecessary ordering. Um, requiring something titled as an antibiotic justification note rather than just calling it an indication and then having that displayed and made available to all clinicians reading that patient's record reduces inappropriate prescribing. Um, and then uh, lots of other studies showing that having something pre-selected um, increases the frequency of that thing remaining selected, um, whether that's what you want or not. So the third paper uh, I wanted to look at was a, um, a report, a paper report that uh, was uh, that came out in June this year, and it was a study um, that was led by the behavioural economics teams of the Commonwealth Department of Health and the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Um, and from what I could tell, they they um, they collaborated with NPS for it. Uh, and it was a study looking at peer comparison feedback for general practitioners. And it, it seemed to be based on a similar intervention that was done in the UK a couple of years ago, where GP practices with high prescribing rates received letters from their chief medical officer and they were able to show a 3% reduction in prescribing over six months. So the UK study, the, the, the letters were targeted, the, the information in the letters showed the comparison for the practice as a whole, whereas this study showed the peer group comparison in, um, information for the actual individual general practitioner and so they hypothesised that that would have a greater impact um, if you were targeting a person as an individual compared with just your practice-wide um, results. It was a cluster randomised controlled trial. There were about 6,000 GPs uh, involved and they targeted those whose prescribing rates were in the top 30% of their geographic region. And so letters were sent to them addressed from our Chief Medical Officer. Uh, they were sent in June last year to coincide with the yearly spike in antibiotic use and the <laughs> GPs were grouped by clinic and then they were randomly assigned to one of five groups. So there was a control group. And then the other four groups were the intervention groups where they received one of four types of letters. Um, the first was an education only letter. Uh, so there was some NPS education material plus a general education um, letter addressed from the CMO. Uh, the second was education with peer comparison, but the, the peer comparison was written in text form. The third was peer comparison with a graph, so a, a much shorter, much more succinct letter where uh, pretty much all I showed was just a graphical representation of uh, their peer comparison. And then the fourth was the peer comparison information displayed in text form, but with additional information on delayed prescribing. Uh, and so they found that um, the interventions <coughs> containing some sort of a peer comparison had a marked impact on prescribing rates in the six months after the invention after the intervention. Uh, and so you can see that the education only group <laughs> didn't have very much impact, um, but the ones with some level of peer comparison had a much greater impact. And the one that seemed to work the best was a very short, succinct letter with a graphical representation of, um, of their comparative results. Uh, so that was, that was great. Uh, but if you have a look at the effect of the intervention over time, it did start to, to wane by the end of the six month period. So they had a really good um, uh, effect up until around about September, and then it started to come back to baseline. Um, so, I mean, I guess at the end of the six months, there was still a, a positive effect compared with the control, but you can see that clearly the education only one didn't have much of an impact at all. And so my thoughts for this were, um, I suppose if you draw a line of best fit, 
what would March 2018 look like? And I think it probably would have come back to baseline. Um, this, this intervention was only done once, so it was only the one letter that doctors uh, received in July. Uh, so you, you could hypothesise that had they received some sort of a follow-up letter that, that the effect of that intervention might have continued. Um, but the, I, I thought, I mean, the, the title of the report was Nudge versus Superbugs, but I'm not, I don't know if it's technically actually a nudge. It, it seems a little bit too overt to be a nudge and it, and it certainly wasn't um, uh, something that was sort of pervasive in the environment of, of prescribing. Um, and so I think that, yes, they've clearly used um, theories in behavioural economics to design the study and it had an impact, but um, I don't know whether it counts as a nudge. I'm not, I'm not entirely convinced about that. Uh, but nonetheless, the intervention was effective to begin with, so you could hypothesise that perhaps being able to build something like this into an electronic system would have a much better and a much more long-lasting effect. Um, okay, so some of my concluding thoughts was that our supposed nudges are present in our everyday lives and we don't necessarily know um, that it's happening and perhaps those are the ones that are the most effective. Um, the ones that we don't notice, the ones that are very subtle and continuous and pervasive. And I think um, that it's a good opportunity to be exploring how we could be doing this now. Um, the, the presence of electronic systems um, is becoming um, more and more important in patient management. And so it does provide a good opportunity to try and inc uh, incorporate a lot of these nudge concepts to enhance antimicrobial stewardship. And that's it. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, Carolyn, the, the menu option one when I had the group one. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I wonder how much of the effect there was just the donkey vote effect. So, uh, and, and how much effect the donkey vote effect has. Yeah, matters. yeah. So, yeah. you just had the antibiotic you want to be prescribed at the top of a straight list. Yes. How much of an effect would that have? Uh, I'm sure it would have had definitely had an effect. And there are, um, I think there's other papers looking that uh, about, you know, obviously the first thing that you list is the one that people are most likely to um, to tick, which is why there's such a um, push when it comes to election time to have your party listed as the top one on the um, on the ballot sheet. Um, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know how much it would have um, impacted, would have had effect in this particular study, but no doubt there, there would have been, yeah, there would have been some sort of an effect. <coughs> With um, the redesign of guidance in the approval system, has it made you think about how um, choice should be presented to, to the scientists? Uh, yeah, oh, so the, the question was with the redesign of the guidance system um, has, has, I suppose, the concept of nudging um, um, impacted on our, on the way that we've designed the new system. So I, I think clearly, yes. I suppose one of the issues um, with guidance um, at the moment is, is because um, sort of the, the indications are listed up front and we've tried to make it very quick and easy for the doctors to pick, which is great from a time point of view, but um, maybe thinking about, well, actually, how do we sort of actually steer them down the right path and, and present the most optimal recommendations for them. So. Um, a lot of you will be aware, but I suppose one of the big things with the new um, guidance redesign is having a universal indications list and, and trying to build our algorithms from the point of view of the indication um, with uh, all the different um, uh, decision points and, and arriving at a recommendation rather than um, necessarily getting them to, to pick what they think they want um, right from the very beginning. Because we, I mean, I suppose we know that patients, it, it's easier to gain the system um, when, when that occurs. And so leading them down the right path, which might be a, take a little bit more time, but might, um, you might get better patient outcomes at the end of it. Yes. Um, I guess I was also wondering about the, the intervention from the CMO, whether, whether a second letter that went out 
six months later, oh, whether definitely. they would be resistant to that effect or whether they would stand yeah. Um, so I, I suppose we don't know because they didn't do it, but I mean, if I was a GP and I received just one letter and I went to all this effort to change my prescribing and I got no follow-up, I would probably be a little bit annoyed and go, well, what was the point of that? I'm just going to do um, whatever I did. And, and the authors did acknowledge that in, in the paper. Um, I think that, um, I, I mean, I, I think that it probably would have a, had a positive effect, if, especially if you'd gone to the effort to try and reduce your prescribing and you could now be shown with a letter from the CMO that your prescribing was closer to your peers and, and that you'd done a good job. Um, yeah, I think that would have had a much more long-lasting um, effect. <coughs> I'm not just um, yeah, following up on that question, are they sustainable in the long term? Like, are they examples of nudges that have been sustainable in time? Uh, that's a good question. They're, um, um, I th yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to. Um, trying to remember, there. I know there has been at least one paper that I read that looked at the impact of a nudge, sort of twelve months after um, after the intervention. I don't. There, there doesn't seem to have been many that have followed things up for beyond twelve months. Most of them, sort of six months, and then maybe up to twelve months, and have yeah still shown a sustained impact. Although that hasn't been quite as much as um, immediately after it was implemented. Um, but as far as I know, nothing more longer lasting than that in terms of what's been studied. But uh, I suppose if you think of nudges in our everyday life. Um, you know, things like the way that a supermarket is designed for the fresh stuff at the back and, <laughs> and the junk at the front and vice versa, encouraging, um, you know, good eating with fresh fruit at the front. You know, those sorts of things, I suppose, once they kind of become part of your everyday practice and your everyday life, then, then yes, it is, it is long lasting because it's always there and you sort of become used to doing things in a certain way now. I think the intention with the Commonwealth um, program is to try and address the top Thank you, Caroline. And Mignon, if you could um, share your screen now. Thank you for inviting me to be part of the Journal Club. I've always enjoyed um, dialing in, so it's, it's nice to actually share some of the, the work that I've been involved in. So Arjun asked me to present on a study that I had recently um, published, and that is uh, titled An Underutilized Station Resource for Antimicrobial Stewardship, the Role of the Community Pharmacist in a delayed wait or see antibiotic prescribing. So as some background information, um, uh, community pharmacists are really an underutilized resource for antimicrobial stewardship, but they are well placed uh, to be effective members of the team. And they're able to collaborate both with prescribers and patients. Um, there are some interventions that they've already um, been involved in, mainly in Australia, which is the vaccination program. They also have a role in intervening to prevent unnecessary antibiotic use, um, and then obviously can play um, quite a large role in educating both patients and providers. It's important to remember that um, often pharmacists are the gateways to healthcare and um, patients will often seek uh, a pharmacist before making an appointment with their general practitioner. 
Um, but in order to have this responsibility, um, the, the pharmacists need to be uh, ensure that they have a, a good source of um, information and um, that they stay up to date and can provide a good education system to the, the patients as well. And then in one of the projects that I was working with, um, I was fortunate to work with some really um, leaders uh, in the field for general practitioners. And one of them is Mika Fendriel. And she said, you know, if you can avoid a, a patient getting to a GP, um, then you most likely to avoid the patient receiving an antibiotic prescription. So I think that's quite an important concept to keep in mind as well. So I had a look to see what community pharmacists were doing in the arena of antimicrobial stewardship and um, uh, looking at what's happening in the international scene, it seems that um, the UK has been doing quite a bit of work in this area and they have a pharmacy infection network group that's, that spans from what I could see across um, both community and, and hospital pharmacists. I also had a look at other programs. Uh, the Strama program, as we know, have been doing a lot of work in the community setting, but they seem to mainly focus on prescribers rather than pharmacists. So as we know, um, and Caroline in her excellent presentation, and it was really good, Caroline, that um, you, you did such a wonderful introduction to the, the nudge factor, which is really a delayed prescribing, as you mentioned, is a, a nudge factor. Um, but basically, the, um, what we're doing in Australia is really been reliant on the National Prescribing Service um, Medicine Wise program uh, and they have a number of online educational programs um, available for pharmacists but I'm not too sure what the uptake of these programs are by community pharmacists. So as we all know um, Australia is, is unfortunately leading the way um, in the antibiotic use and prescribing um, uh, in developed countries um, for the most, one of the most common um, presentations to a GP is for acute upper respiratory um, tract infections. And in, in many cases, patients do end up getting a, a prescription, an antibiotic prescription, um, whether it's appropriate or not. And as we know, in many cases, the prescribing would be inappropriate. So why do GPs use so many antibiotics? So these um, are some thoughts and concepts that have come from GPs themselves. Uh, we were very fortunate just to do a fantastic workshop at GP18, um, which was held at the, the Gold Coast and Jeff Sperling along with Mika Vendriel and some other um, well-known GPs were, were part of the program. And so these are some of the ideas that they have come up with. And I think it's not um, unique. I mean, they, it's the diagnosis of uncertainty, um, the skill set of the GP, um, there's a lot of patient pressure. And also um, an important uh, thought is really uh, the time of day that you go and see your, your GP. So if you um, go and see your GP in the first hour that your GP is seeing patients, you're less likely to, to get a prescription for an antibiotic. But if you go towards the end of their shift, um, you're much more likely to get an antibiotic. And I think in many ways they see um, a form of closure of the, um, of the consult is by providing a patient with a prescription. So moving on to delayed antibiotic prescribing, and this is um, something that Caroline alluded to in her um, presentation. So delayed antibiotic prescribing can be done in a few ways. Um, one way is where the, the GP actually gives the, the patient the prescription with the advice 
that the patient shouldn't have it filled straight away. They can post-date that prescription. Um, they can also say we'll leave the prescription um, with the um, front staff uh, at the reception and you can pick it up at a later stage. But in my experience, in most cases, the, the GP provides the patient with a prescription with the advice not to have it um, filled unless they, uh, the patient is not improving in, in about 48 hours. So what that means is that it's really up to the patient then to decide what they want to do. And in, in some cases, the patient will have that prescription um, filled so they can get the, uh, have the antibiotic on hand. Sometimes these prescriptions will be saved because they're valid for a year for um, a later occurrence when they feel they have the same signs and symptoms and they'll get the antibiotic filled for another condition or what they think is the same condition but at a later period. So there are downsides to um, delay prescribing. So in this um, graph here, what we can see is delayed um, antibiotic prescribing um, has been shown to decrease antibiotic use. Um, in, in this um, Cochrane review, it really uh, was a, a small um, decrease from 91% to 86%. In some studies, it's been a lot larger than that um, versus the in immediate prescription. As far as, um, uh, sorry, that's the patient satisfaction that I was referring to. So there's been a, a, a large decrease in antibiotic prescribing from 93 to 31%. And as you can see, the, the patient satisfaction ratings have not changed. Um, uh, significantly. So um, Caroline very nicely went over this study and so what you can see the peer comparison with delayed um, prescribing uh, did result in a 10% decrease in, in antibiotic use. So um, uh, the study that we did for the pharmacist was really part of the general practitioner antimicrobial stewardship study program study where we uh, had a look at uh, the feasibility and uptake of a suite of interventions um, for antimicrobial stewardship and primary care. So basically these interventions, there was an education module which the GPs could access at their own um, time. There was the delayed prescribing protocol, and I'll go into that in a little bit detail in the next slide. There were um, patient decision aids, so that's where uh, the clinician, um, the prescriber, and the the, uh, the patient look at the number of needed to treat versus the number needed of harm. So we've got um, the smiley faces in the top right hand. Um, a graph and you can see there that in many cases, particularly for acute respiratory tract infections, the number needed to harm outweighs the number needed to treat. Um, a, a nudge factor that has been uh, quite highly um, uh, received is the displaying a poster on the practice of prescribing policy and this would be in the GP's um, waiting room as well as the consultation room. And the nice thing about this nudge factor was that um, the GP's photo was actually displayed on the, the, the poster with their signature endorsing that um, that would give the best treatment to the patient, but it might not necessarily mean that um, patients would actually uh, receive an antibiotic. So um, the, the patients really liked this intervention because they could see it was the picture, they liked seeing the picture of their GP on the photo as well as that reassurance that the, the GP was going to do the best for them. And I often think um, uh, my primary practice is, is in hospital uh, pharmacy these days or in hospitals. Um, and uh, we write all these policies that somehow get buried um, on the internet or filed away but if we can translate some of our policies to um, these nudge factors or posters or more visible um, things and make people more accountable, 
um, there's no way, there's no reason why you shouldn't have an, an antibody prescribing policy displayed in a poster format and have your um, heads of units endorse it by having their photos on the, the post as well. And maybe that would be a simple nudge factor that people can think about now that we're coming up to Antibiotic Awareness Week. So just moving on, um, we've got the, the patient pamphlet, which was a, a, a compilation of the, the poster. And um, that was just that the patient had something to take home with them as well. And then also the, um, the access in the, the consultation rooms or in the, the practice, GP practices to a, a, um, a C-reactive protein test. So the delayed prescribing protocol, the one thing that we did that was a, a little bit different was we had a, a sticker displayed on the um, prescription. So that was kind of a, a reminder to the patient um, and then also served as a reminder to the pharmacist. And uh, when I was reading the study that Caroline presented, um, the nudge versus the um, superbug study, um, it was nice to see that they also provided uh, stickers for the, the patients, so um, maybe they copied our good idea. Um, so the feedback for the delayed prescribing from the GPs was they found the sticker was very useful. Um, many of them were using it in principle. It was definitely the one intervention that they all took up. Um, they could pick and choose which interventions they wanted to use, but this is the one they all use. Um, and uh, so they, they liked having the sticker to reinforce that. Um, some of them have concerns, which are, I think, very valid that, you know, does the patient have the insight to recognize that they need to start antibiotics and the, the GPs uh, would refer to um, review the patient before that happened. Um, so moving on to, to our study that we, we looked at. Um, so this is uh, recently been published in the International Journal of Pharmacy Practice. And um, when I was having a look at the, the literature, um, there's a lot of literature about what the prescribers say, but there's very little literature about what does the pharmacist say. And so that reminded me of this um, song that my son used to like to sing, what does the fox say? We all know what the other animals say, but we don't know what the fox sounds like. So the um, methods that we used, we did an online survey with community uh, pharmacists um, and it was based in Queensland. We advertised it through two pharmacy organizations using their e-newsletters. Um, a descriptive analysis to examine the response and obtained ethics approval. So um, we did get a, a response. It was a, quite a, a small response, um, but I think it still gives a, a fair indication of, of what community pharmacists are thinking. Um, we targeted both pharmacists and um, interns. Um, so we got a, a spectrum of um, reflective answers and then um, moving down to uh, uh, the position of the respondent in the pharmacy because you might think an owner of the pharmacy might have a more vested insert in dispensing prescriptions versus people that were receiving a salary. So that would be the manager or a pharmacy employee. But uh, there was sort of a, a equal spread amongst those groups. Um, so also would the location of the pharmacy make a difference? Um, so about a third of the, the pharmacies are co-located to a medical center. So you would think that might improve um, communication between the GPs and the, the pharmacists, but I'm not too sure if that always happens. So um, this is the community pharmacist um, decision if they got a delayed prescription, um, they would, 60% uh, they said they would not dispense the prescription. Um, there were a group of pharmacists, 11% said they would dispense it straight away and they wouldn't provide any additional advice to the patient. They would just give them the antibiotic prescription. 
and then um, another third said they would dispense the prescription and then advise the patient to see the doctor if they were not feeling better or if their symptoms got worse. So I thought that was that was quite interesting. Um, they had some interesting comments. Um, once again, they, they liked having the visual cue um, and they felt it would encourage a more comprehensive counseling by the pharmacist because when the pharmacy, the pharmacist sees a prescription, you're not too, always sure um, the intent of the GP and um, what the indication is for the, the antibiotic. Um, and they also said it may decrease unnecessary use of antibiotics um, and save the, the patient from repeatedly visiting the doctor. Um, they, they thought you needed to target which patients it would be suitable for. Um, and in some areas they thought in more rural areas where it's difficult to access a, a GP clinic, um, it might be a helpful intervention. Um, they felt that uh, the doctors, uh, the prescribers needed more education about the concept and they also needed to be a more community awareness of the concept as well. Um, uh, high, one, uh, this was really highlighted by a few of the respondents. Um, as most of you know, the maximum validity period for prescription is one year and this is um, based on most prescriptions are for chronic medications for repeats, um, but uh, the, they highlighted that it should be shorter for antibiotic prescriptions because most infections are acute conditions. And I, this is a summary mark. I, I thought it was quite informative and insightful. Um, I believe it would work more effectively if included as part of an individualized treatment protocol um, developed by the GP for the patient. So the patients are educated and have tried symptomatic management first. So um, they also believe that there needs to be more education of community pharmacists and uh, AMS as a whole requires a clear message um, and the continuity of care to be provided to the patient. And I thought that was a really nice insightful summary comment um, by one of our respondents. We also provided them with a, a scenario. This was a 66 year old man who came to a pharmacy with a two day history of a clear runny nose, a cough with a green yellow sputum. And he says he does not have a temperature in the underlying respiratory condition or comorbidity that you need to be worried about. So 11% said they would advise the patient to see the, the doctor immediately and that the patient needs an antibiotic. And then 12% um, said they would see his doctor in two to three days if he's not improving or if he gets worse. So um, that, that, that kind of highlights the, 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 the level of education and what's being done at pharmacy school. What are they educating? Um, uh, the pharmacist or potential pharmacist about the management of acute respiratory infections. So any um, study obviously is done by a whole group of people and those are the people involved in the study. So I then went and had a look at um, what are other published studies um, on community pharmacy and antimicrobial stewardship and um, Actually, it is surprisingly little information that has been published or evaluated. Um, but this one study was recently published. It came out in August 2018 and a study from Tasmania. And really it highlights that there's a lack of training um, for community pharmacists. There's a lack of access to patient records. There's limited interactions with GPs and um, there's an absence of a reimbursement model. So pharmacists um, for the most part are reimbursed really by the, um, the dispensing model. So by the, what you sell in the French shop and then also about the, the medications that you dispense, not by, they're not reimbursed for any services that provide. And that's very different to other healthcare providers 
which are all reimbursed for their services. And I think it would make a big difference if we, if our pharmacy profession could um, move away from our current um, uh, reimbursement model to more uh, fee for service. Um, so what are the, the ground rules, um, you know, for, for patients when you're working for patients? And so this um, study was really uh, addressing more uh, prescribers, but I think uh, it will apply a lot to pharmacists as well. So it's important to know that patients are more concerned about what you can do for them now while they're sick than, rather than the public health problem of resistance. And then the strongest determinant of patient satisfaction is that the patient understood your advice. So if you as a prescriber decide not to give an antibiotic, they need to clearly know why you made that decision. If you as a pharmacist give them advice about um, something, you need to be well informed and the patient needs to clearly understand why you're giving them this advice. Um, so in summary, uh, community pharmacists are well placed to be effective stewards and they can play an important role in collaboration. Um, they are uh, underutilized resources, our title implies. Um, they do require the support and form of training um, and promoting greater interaction with GPs. And as I mentioned, um, we need to have a look at the reimbursement structure for pharmacists as well. And so this is our team as of the 1st of November. Um, we will have a new uh, director, uh, Dr. Trent Yarwood. So we're very excited to welcome him to our team. Um, and then we're fortunate to have a, a nurse uh, as well. Many of you know Stacey McNamara and there's myself, the pharmacist, and we're well supported by Hannah, our program, program manager. So at this stage, I'll um, open it up for, for questions. Okay, thank you, Mignon. That was excellent. Uh, if you have any questions from the floor, I'll repeat them and um, then you'd be able to hear them as well. Mignon is Kaz. Um, I think there are serious structural barriers in our healthcare system to engage in yes. pharmacists. Mignon, it's Kaz. I think we all know there are serious structural barriers to engage the community pharmacists at multiple levels. What would be the first thing you would do? <laughs> If I was the Minister of Health. <laughs> yeah, if you're, the, if you're the Minister of Health, yeah. Yes, yeah, so as, as I said, um, I think a lot of it revolves around money. And um, the, that's why I mentioned the reimbursement structure. I think we need to move away from the dispensing fee structure and uh, promote the profession of pharmacy as, as a whole and look at um, so the, the doctors as you know you have a provider number or prescriber number um, pharmacists should get a, um, a some sort of number as well so we can um, charge for our, our, our services uh, that we're delivering and then that will move the pharmacists out of the dispensary, they'll get pharmacy assistance to do all the dispensing. They'll have this a greater interaction with patients. That's my opinion. Um, uh, yeah, it's a <laughs> so there's kickbacks from the, there is a, uh, there is certainly a section of um, the general practice community that are very concerned about pharmacist prescribers um, and how would you address that? Yes, I think um, I, I've worked in the United States as, as well and uh, uh, that's probably where we did do have uh, the greatest uh, history of pharmacist prescribers and um, 
uh, to be honest, they've actually worked very successfully with, uh, with GPs, focusing more on chronic conditions um, and conditions uh, where patients are on multiple drugs. And uh, that's actually worked quite nicely where uh, pharmacists have taken on sort of the anticoagulant <coughs> management of patients or taken on the management of cholesterol or diabetes. Um, so I think if you form that collaborative uh, partnership, um, it actually complements uh, the, the service quite well and that might be a, a, a way forward. Uh, certainly if you look at what other countries do, have done, they, they've been able to, to um, both have a win-win situation out of that uh, collaborative approach. Um, thanks, Mignon. There is a question from Oliver. Um, in your opinion, what are the limitations of delayed prescribing? In a recent UK survey, close to 70% of patients took their antibiotics within their 48 hours. Yes, I mean, that is the, the limitation um, that um, patients feel that they still need an, an, an <coughs> antibiotic. And so you kind of wonder what um, sort of advice that the GP gave. Are they sort of hedging their bets at this stage? Um, and versus not giving anti antibiotics at all and asking the patient to come back and see them. So I think um, one of the, the GPs in our um, the Bigger Gap study, or actually a few of them said, you know, it requires a mindset change um, from the patients. They're so used to saying, oh, I need to go to my doctor to get an antibiotic prescription because I'm been sick for two or three days and need to get back to work. So patients don't understand the normal time duration of a a viral infection. Um, they, uh, the GPs are also um, quite fearful of losing their business. Um, and also the time period for the consultation is very short. It's only 10 minutes. Um, and so, you know, it probably requires a much longer ongoing um, education process than that 10 minute consultation that the GPs can provide. Thanks, Mignon. And just another question from Oliver. I think this relates to what you presented, Kaz, about the um, national peer feedback. Um, my understanding was that the rate of the it was the rate of the in, PBS rate of the individual prescriber that was um, uh, used as their benchmark compared to. But I don't know, was national or read? Was it compared to like the benchmarking was a national? It was compared to their region. That's a good question, Oliver. All right, so I think, is there any more questions from the room? Yeah, one, one, Glenn. No, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know who I'm really directing this to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, minions, Glenn Browning here. I just, uh, I mean, I'm, and I don't know who I'm directing this to, but I just wonder whether the nudge factor that might be particularly important in, in wintertime respiratory tract infections is the requirement for people to get a medical certificate when they're away from work and whether maybe one of the things that could be done quickly would be to to shift shift the capacity for pharmacists to supply a medical certificate when people went in to purchase symptomatic treatments. That's a good idea. <laughs> That's a novel concept. Idea. <laughs> <laughs> Let's quit that immediately. <laughs> Um, so thank you for both our speakers. Mignon from Long Distance Way, thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you in November. Um, this is our last Jenna Club before our forum. I hope all that all of you who are listening um, can um, make the forum and dial in. We will be streaming uh, some of the major sessions through the day. And thank you for all our listeners in. We have we, you. You'll be well, may not be surprised. There's many more people outside this room than inside the room. So thanks all. Thank you, everyone.